Hey, 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 YouTube. How is it going? I hope all is well. Today, we are going to touch up on power supplies. I was going to skip this one initially and go on to something else, but I kind of realized that we, uh, we have some more resistors and capacitors that we need to kind of get in touch with here. Um, also, you kind of need to know this, the power supply in order to, to understand kind of how everything else is going on. So, let's get into it. Um, I picked this particular schematic because it was the cleanest one I could find, and it kind of had most of the elements in it I was looking for. This actually proved to be kind of hard to find. I was looking for one that had, like, a sag resistor in it, had a tube rectifier, and a choke. Uh, finding that wasn't easy. That was also clean and clear and easy to read. I'm trying to ease you into it, if you will, so, eh, whatever. Anyway, let's move on. Um, I also picked this one because it flows from left to right. I like schematics that flow from left to right in their entirety. The preamp and power amp portions of the amp almost always go from left to right. So, I don't know, some some schematics follow that same kind of thing. You get the AC in and then you end up with power out. But some of them also start from the right and go towards the left. Eh, there's no rhyme or reason to it, so it is what it is. All right, let's move on. So on this particular one here, we start at the AC mains in. We see it's fused before the switch. I like that. That's my ideal way of doing it. We've got the power switch. This one says it's 220 volts AC coming in, whatever. And then you'll notice it says power transformer. There are two types of transformers in an amplifier and they are pretty much the same, but not the same. A transformer, the way to think of it is like a voltage to current exchanging device. And that's kind of the easiest way I can think of to explain it. So if you have a voltage coming in, on the other side, you're going to have a different voltage coming out. And it's going to be the inverse of the current. So if you have low voltage, high current going in, you're going to have high voltage, low current coming out. Conversely, and that's we're talking power transformer in this case. So it's low voltage coming in, low voltage, high current coming in and it'll be high voltage, low current coming out. All that means is that the way the transformer works, you've got your supply, in this case, the, the wall power. So you have 120 volts at 15 amps worth of current capability. But on the output side, you might have three, four, 500 volts, but it can only handle 500 to maybe 500 milliamps to maybe one, uh, one amp worth of current, right? That's all. And it just depends on the type of transformer. Whereas an output transformer works the other direction. It's high voltage coming in and it's low voltage going out. But it's high voltage, low current coming in, at least on a tube amp. We're not talking about solid state amps at this point. So on a solid state amp, it works a little bit differently. But in this case here, um, with a tube amp, it's high voltage, low current going in but it's low voltage, high current going out. And that's what makes the air move from the speaker. So now that we understand a little bit about how the transformers work, that's kind of a subject all in of itself, but basic idea, we got it. All right, I'm not really gonna touch too much on the heater supply. That's kind of its own thing because there's multiple elements to that that we can talk about. I'm trying to keep this down to about a 20 minute video. But what you do need to know is that the main HT is coming in through this thing here. It says 220 and 220. Um, I'm assuming this means 220, 0, 220. If that were the case, this thing would produce probably more or something like 400 or something volts. Um, but I put some arbitrary numbers here. Sorry, I had to draw on it. So what you know is that each side of this line coming out here is in a different phase. And you can see I kind of drew the AC signal there. And when they converge, after they get through the rectifier, they create the DC element of the amplifier that makes it work. So how it does that is that the diode cuts off the negative going portion of the swing of this signal. So if this is the negative, this would be minus, this would be plus, right? And then this would be the, uh, in this case here, it would be minus, whereas this one's the plus. That kind of thing, right? So uh, it's cutting off the minus element of each of the each side, and when it converges over here, you get the two pluses added together, and you get 
the ripple. They converge together to create whatever voltage, but they cross back down to zero. That's what that ripple is. So it goes up to 300 volts and back down to zero. Up to 300 volts, back down to zero. That's what the reservoir cap is supposed to do, is to get rid of that ripple. It gets charged up with that positive voltage, and then as this swings back down to zero, this releases the voltage that it had stored, reducing the potential for this to go back down to zero. All right, okay? So that's why at this point here, you end up with less ripple. It's more of like a little, just a little wave, for instance. So that's what the primary reservoir cap's job is to do the most of that brunt work in getting the ripple off of the subsequent parts of the amplifier. And as you go through more and more and more stages of filtering, you end up at the end, the C node in this case, with no ripple at all. It's just straight up DC voltage. As far as, as, far as this thing's concerned, it's just as good as hooking it up to a battery, if you will. So that's how it converts AC signal into DC. Now there are different types of rectifiers. This one here is using solid state in a full wave rectifier form. Um, so that's with two diodes going the way that they are. So this is the convergence point there. And I'm hypo hypothesizing that are 300 volts. I just put a number. It doesn't matter. It's not a true number. Um, whereas you can also, if you use a tube rectifier, this is the actual type of rectification it would be. It would be a full wave rectification. So if you had a tube in that spot, an EZ81 or a 5AR4, GZ34, whatever, it would be a full wave rectifier. There are other types though. There's half wave rectification, which is just removing one of these diodes and just connecting the line straight to it. That would be one form. And then the other form would be um, uh, full, wave, full wave bridge rectifier. That's my electro boom right there. Um, so full wave bridge rectification, which means you'd have the diodes in that little square orientation. That is the most efficient of the ways to rectify the voltage. Um, but you would not have the center tap. You couldn't, you can't use the center tap when you have a full wave bridge rectifier, just FYI. So again, that's kind of like a whole nother subject that we need to talk about, but, uh, you kind of get the ideas now. So full wave, full wave rectifier right here. We get the ripple. This guy gets rid of it or removes most of it. And then you go through this first dropping resistor. Now in this particular orientation here, this would be considered the SAG resistor, if you will. Uh, the reason that this is kind of considered a SAG resistor is that all the current from all nodes of this amplifier are flowing through that resistor all by itself, which means that it, as a resistor does, resists current flow, right? It means it is the one that is going to drive the most of that sag that you hear or feel when you play. As you get further down the line, subsequent nodes, there's less and less current demand on those subsequent nodes, which means they're less and less susceptible to that sag. So this one here could, could be considered your sag resistor. However, it does have a secondary function. While it does also reduce the voltage going onto the next node, it also works in conjunction with the next filter capacitor to create the knee at which it will control or demodulate or decouple. These are called decoupling capacitors. So it decouples from the power supply at a specific frequency. So remember when we talked in the last episode about how this creates a single pole filter or a full first order filter? It's the same exact same thing here. I believe I can say that right. Uh, same thing here. So the value of the capacitor and the value of this resistor creates a knee. And it needs to be low enough that it's below the lowest frequency of interest that you're looking to amplify within that amplifier. If it is not, you can have ghost notes. Uh, and you've heard of ghosting before, perhaps. Um, usually you hear about it when you have a bad filter cap. Uh, what it is, is that it's not able to control the, 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 the fluctuations. It's not able to control the ripple. 
and it'll modulate into the actual frequency signal or the signal of the amplifier as it amplifies. And you'll amplify that inability to control that or whatnot. It so it modulates into the actual sound. So there is a an element to those two options there. Uh, you need to first figure out what you want for your resistor, I guess you could say. Um, cause you want to figure out whatever voltage drop you have. So let's say you want this node here to operate at 289 or whatever. So you pick the hundred ohm and with the amount of current draw that exists from this point on, you'll end up with the 289. There are calculators online. I'm not going to go into the math and there's calculators to figure out what the corner frequency is for those two values here as well. So generally you kind of figure this out first based on how much voltage drop you want. So you're looking for X amount of voltage on the screens or something, for instance, or X amount of voltage to hit on the, on the plate of the tube, right? That that's really all you're trying to do is find that particular voltage. So you figure out how much current draw there's going to be between how many tubes you got downstream of it. And that'll tell you, you need a hundred ohm one watt resistor to get that amount of voltage drop. So then you plug that in and then you can find out with another calculator what value of capacitor you need in order to get the you know right amount of filtration so you don't modulate the low frequencies into your actual signal. Now, I will also go backwards just a little bit here. This reservoir cap, there is a limit to how big you can go with that, that capacitor when you are using a tube rectifier. So if you use a tube rectifier, refer to the tube data sheets to find out what the maximum amount of capacitance you can have from its, uh, from its plates, um, or cathodes, excuse me. Um, is it the plates or the cathodes? No, it's the plates, excuse me. Whatever. Um, you need to know that. Uh, generally, 60 UF is about the highest you can get away with, and that's something like the GZ34, 5AR4s, and whatnot. Like Those have the highest capacitance that they can allow, and it's generally higher than you can than you can go with this value normally. It's You're not going to find a 60 UF capacitor, and it wouldn't be wise to go with a 60 UF. So 47 UF is probably the most common for that position. However, an EZ81, I think, only has 40 UF worth of capacitance you know that it's able to have so you couldn't go with a 47 uf so normally you would go with a 30 or a 33 uf in this position if you had an easy 81 now solid state rectifiers it doesn't matter how high you go at that point you can go with 100 you can go with 200 you can go with a thousand uf if you wanted solid state doesn't care tube rectifiers do so be mindful of that all right so we've gotten down to this point here we see that we reduce the amount of ripple now, this guy here, this little resistor right there, is actually just there for safety. We've talked about it as a bleed resistor in some episodes, uh, other episodes. I, didn't, I haven't talked it in the basic series, but um, this is actually here to just let the voltage drain off of the capacitors, the filter caps, at, when the amp's turned off. When the amp is on and operating, it just doesn't do anything. It's such a low number, it's, just, it's not affecting much, if anything at all. So, it just turns you know it just wastes electricity as heat at that point that's all it does so you've done your math you know from the b node down to the c node you've got x amount of current draw and you were trying to get to say 250 volts at the b node um, because that's what you want on your your screen grid right so you do the math with the calculators that you can find online and you find out that you want a 2k one watt resistor great how you know, then you can go online again with that data and figure out what value of capacitance you need to have the right amount of filtration. That's it. And then you repeat again. So let's say your uh, C node, which in this case here would be the first preamp, you want to have 189 volts, whatever reason. So then you find out that you need, you know, with the amount of milliamp draw from that one tube and the amount of voltage that you got, you need a 10K one watt resistor. That's it. You put the 10K one watt, you should end up right around 189 volts. And then again, you can either arbitrarily just put the same value in like they did with all of theirs, or you can put in a lower one like 16 UF, which would probably be more than high enough. That's all. So the hope is that, of course, with the amount of filtration that you have and the value of the resistor that you have to create a voltage drop, and you must have something there. Uh, too low is not a good thing. Um, 
there is a relationship. So the lower this value is, the bigger this one needs to be to create that corner frequency we were talking about. Whereas conversely, the larger this value is, the lower you can get away with on your filter uh, capacitor. So there's probably, depending on what value you use here, a minimum number of what you can get away with here, depending on the yeah, depending on the current draw to get the voltage drop that you need. Just as an FYI, but go through that kind of mentality. What voltage do I want? What filtration do I need? And that will kind of get you there. By the time you get to the C node, you're probably going to be very well mitigated in terms of ripple and you won't have to worry about it too much. Uh, the hope is that by the time you get past the B node, you've gotten all the ripple out of it though. So that's what these first three capacitors are really going to do here is get all that ripple gone. So by the time you get here, it shouldn't be an issue. And that's it. I mean, that's kind of already set us through this whole amplifier here. Um, you'll notice here that this one has A, B, and C nodes. Some schematics will just show it drawn out to where wherever it might go. Um, I find those to be a little too confusing because you end up with lines all over the place, but um, that is a me thing. Uh, I like this kind of layout here, although I probably wouldn't have this line come all the way down. I would probably... I see what they're trying to do here. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, I, I get exactly what they're trying to do here. So, with this heater supply, which I said we weren't really going to talk about, um, they're using an elevated heater supply. This is a Class A single-ended um, amplifier, so it's the most prone to noise of most all the designs out there because it doesn't have CMR to reduce noise. So what they do is they went with a, uh, uh, a hum balance circuit, if you will, um, an artificial center tap, as it also is called, but it's elevated, and it's elevated to the cathode of this tube, which puts it up at like 60 volts or something like that, which closes up the difference between its, you know, highest voltage potential and its lowest voltage potential, but you know, with the heaters, which makes it run quieter. So that's why they ran that line across there like they did. Um, in other amps, this would just go to ground and it would just be an artificial center tap. This is still an artificial center tap, but it's an elevated heater supply. That's how you can think of it that way. Um, so that's why it connects directly to the uh, cathode of the output tube. You cannot use a regular center tap in this orientation here. So if you have a power transformer that has a uh, center tapped uh, 6.3 volt heater supply, you need to make sure that you, if you're going to go with a, an elevated or an artificial center tap, that you pull out the, uh, the center tap that exists for the power transformer for that section of the amp. Uh, will not work. It'll instantaneous power transformer failure don't want don't want that um i'm gonna leave it at that because i mean that really is a subject of its own obviously this is a cathode biased amplifier so there is no bias circuit in here um if it's a fixed bias amp there will be a bias circuit which is a whole nother topic to go over because there's a couple different ways of doing that so i managed to get this under 20 minutes holy cow um, I want to thank you so much for sticking with me, uh, if you have, if not, well, I don't know, but if you did, I hope that you learned something. I hope this kind of gets you into the idea of how the power section of your amp works and what it does. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in the next one.